My name is uh, Wick Haxton. I'm the chair of the physics department. And uh, this is the, it's my honor to welcome you to what is now the 21st uh, annual uh, Robert Oppenheimer uh, lecture. This lecture uh, th this week comes at a really special time. Uh, next Monday uh, marks to the day the 150th anniversary of the University of California. It was at that point that the, uh, the, the uh, state assembly passed the bill that, that uh, created the University of California uh, campus here at Berkeley. Uh, the charge that was given to Berkeley at that time was, uh, is interesting. It's very appropriate for today as well. Uh, to provide instruction and thorough and complete education in all departments of science, literature, and art, industrial and professional pursuits. And today we actually encapsulate this in the UC uh, motto, which is uh, fiat lux, uh, to bring new knowledge to light. Uh, so we are proud that on our 150th birthday, Berkeley stands as the world's premier public university. It combines uh, outstanding scholarship with our goal of making educational, uh, education accessible to all. The Oppenheimer Lecture, the, uh, the 21st of which you'll hear tonight, was established in 1998. Uh, the past lecturers are uh, literally a who's who of theoretical physics. They include uh, C.N. Yang, Freeman Dyson, Frank Wilczek, Gerard de Hoof, Robert Laughlin, uh, Martin Rees, Ed Witten, uh, Stephen Hawking, uh, Claude Coantanucci, uh, Murray Gell-Mann, and Kip Thorne. And one other, our own Marvin Cohen, who is in the audience tonight. Uh, Robert Oppenheimer was born in uh, 1904. He grew up in an upper uh, middle class uh, family in Manhattan. Uh, he graduated from Harvard, uh, majoring in chemistry. Uh, entered Cambridge University in 1924 as a graduate student in the hope of working with Ernest Rutherford. Then he left uh, two years later in 1926 to finish his PD, PhD with uh, Max Born in, in Göttingen. He published more than a dozen papers while with Born, uh, mostly focused on the theory of the new quantum mechanics. This included what is probably his most famous work, the uh, Born-Oppenheimer approximation, that describes how you simplify uh, molecular physics by separating the slow motion of the nucleus from the faster motion of the electrons. His oral PhD exam was administered by a Nobel laureate, uh, James Frank, who stated afterward, I am glad it is over. He was on the point of questioning me. <laughs> Thereafter, Oppenheimer joined Caltech as a research fellow, but also spent most of his first year after his PhD working with Ernst in Leiden and Wolfgang Pauli at ETH. In 1929, on returning to the US, he accepted an associate professorship from Berkeley and he remained here for the next 15 years. Uh, during this period, he did a lot of marvelous work and uh, built a, a fantastic theory group around him. He published the most famous paper, uh, one of the most famous papers with uh, Volkov, establishing what is known as the tolman oppenheimer volkov limit on the maximum mass of a neutron star, the mass above which a, a star has to collapse into a black hole. Uh, the observation just six months ago of the merger of two neutron stars helped us fix that mass, maximum mass at just under 2.2 solar masses. His, uh, his scientific leadership uh, that, uh, that he demonstrated here at Berkeley uh, complicated his later life and his role in science. Uh, he was selected in 1942 to lead uh, World War II's Manhattan Project's engineering lab, uh, which he helped site at Los Alamos, New Mexico, uh, very near uh, a ranch that he owned. Uh, his work culminated there in the successful Trinity test. The decision uh, by our government, government to then use uh, atomic weapons in the, the war against Japan was an issue that troubled Oppenheimer for the rest of his life. After World War II, Oppenheimer became uh, very much a, the public face of science in the US, and it was featured on covers of, of, of Time Magazine and Life. Uh, this period of his life was effectively ended a decade later with the controversial loss of his security clearance in 1954, reflecting the fears at that time that were generated by the new Cold War. Uh, some 10 years later, there was some resolution to this with, uh, with the uh, honor that President Kennedy uh, bestowed on him, the Fermi Award that was presented by Lyndon Johnson after Kennedy's death. In a sense, Oppenheimer's legacy here at Berkeley is a simpler one that we strive to continue today. And it's really summarized by a plaque that you can visit uh, by going up to the fourth floor of Old LeConte. And we took a photo of that this morning. It simply says, 
that in these, in these uh, corner offices, 1929 to 1942, J. Robert Oppenheimer created the greatest school of theoretical physics the world has ever known. So it's a very high standard that we try to live up to today. That quote came from, came from Hans Bethe. So now it's my great pleasure to introduce my colleague, Saul Permutter, who was the UC professor of physics in 2011 Nobel laureate. He's going to introduce tonight's uh, Oppenheimer lecturer, um, Michael Turner from the University of Chicago. Saul. Well, good evening, and um, I have the great pleasure of uh, introducing our distinguished speaker today, who is uh, Professor Michael Turner. Um, he's the Bruce V. Rayner Distinguished Service Professor at the University of Chicago, and also the uh, director of the Kavli Institute for Cosmological F uh, Physics, which he helped establish in 2004. And he's also a, a favorite colleague of many of us uh, cosmologists. Um, Michael received his uh, BS from Caltech and PhD from Stanford, and then, uh, together with a few theoretical astrophysicist colleagues, proceeded to be a driving force in bringing together the fields of particle physics and cosmology. Along with many key papers and the training of many grad students and postdocs, he, together with Rocky Kolb, founded the Fermilab Astrophysics Group, and then wrote, they wrote a book, The Early Universe, uh, that became a standard um, in the field, teaching a whole generation of cosmologists. Uh, um, it's worth, I think it's worth commenting that when a field is relatively small, a few people really help shape the mood of the field. And, uh, and Michael and, and Rocky set a standard of, of playful curiosity um, that I think has really played an important role. So I just called that out. Um, his, his work itself addressed and often set most of the agenda items of the field from Big Bang nucleosynthesis, dark matter and its candidate particles, to inflation and the current so-called lambda CDM picture of cosmology. With respect to this, um, I can personally attest to a, uh, a a minor uh, but, but fun claim to fame of Michael's, um, which is that right after we had measured the accelerating expansion of the universe, Michael and our, our Berkeley uh, colleague, Mike Martin White, um, led a paper that I joined them on that needed a term to describe what it is that is causing the acceleration of the universe. And I remember a phone call with Michael um, in which he convinced me that rather than calling it something you know, nerdy like elastic energy, we should use the Star Wars-y term dark energy. And, uh, and of, you know, of course, he was absolutely right. Um, if you want to make a field exciting as it is, um, it needs to be able to talk about things like dark matter and dark energy um, as its fundamental mysteries. And uh, of course, I, I'm, I'm sure Michael had already started using this term and was just letting me catch up you know, in, that, in that call. Um, Finally, Michael has played a, a key role as a science in, in science policy. He led the Mathematical and Physical Science Directorate at the National Science Foundation um, in the mid-2000s, and also led a very influential National Academy of Science report called Quarks to the Cosmos that helped shape science policy in physics. Of course, um, I personally remember the, the early days uh, when he had time to serve on committees reviewing work we were doing here at Berkeley. And, uh, and he was one of the few commi committee members who thought what, what we were that we were doing something important. So, um, so for me, it's, it's a real pleasure uh, to have the opportunity to, to welcome uh, Mike, Mike Turner as, uh, as this year's Oppenheimer lecturer. And um, his title is What Happened Before the Big Bang and Other Big Questions About the Universe. So please, welcome, uh, please join me in welcoming Michael Turner. Thank you. That was very generous. Well, good evening. It's a real honor to be the uh, 2018 Oppenheimer lecturer. And it's also a real honor to be uh, introduced. Wick and I were graduate students together at that other school on the other side, San, San Jose State or something like that. <laughs> I can't remember what it's called. Um, and Saul and I are very good friends. So not only is it an honor to be here as a lecturer, but I get to talk about my favorite subject, which is cosmology. And uh, so I thought I would start out slow and then speed up to this question about what happened. Oh, I didn't intend that joke, but that was pretty good. Uh, uh, 
So the universe is really big. Does everybody know that? Billions is, the, is, you know, whenever somebody asks you about the universe, the answer is billions. And it's often beyond the reach of our minds and our instruments. But the past two decades have seen revolutionary progress due to big ideas and powerful instruments. And uh, because, as you heard, Oppie was an idea guy, I'm going to emphasize the idea the ideas over the instruments. So what is the big idea that I'm going to emphasize? And it's been mentioned already, um, and you'll see it throughout the talk. And the big idea are the deep connections between the very small, the elementary particles, and the very big. So that's the big idea that has helped power this revolution in our understanding of the universe. Now, um, you, even if you're a theorist, you get seduced by the powerful instruments. So I, I've got to remind you that this is science. It's not science fiction. Um, and so we actually rely on evidence. I know we have to remind people that you know, evidence is a good thing. And uh, so we've, we've been helped by powerful instruments. So you know this is the top of Mauna Kea and the Keck telescopes. And uh, other people have telescopes in Chile. Uh, the Europeans and uh, the Carnegie Institution. We have fantastic telescopes at the South Pole. Uh, there are big telescopes in space. Uh, let's see, I, see if I can name them. The Hubble, uh, the Chandra Telescope, the Fermi Gamma Ray Observatory, and the Spitzer. And uh, oh my god, let's see. Hubble was Chicago, Chandra was Chicago, <laughs> and Fermi was Chicago. I had never noticed that before. <laughs> OK. Uh, a quick orientation uh, to the universe. So I'm going to start slow, so, and then I'm going to speed up. Uh, so the basics of our universe, 100 billion galaxies, each lit with the light of about 100 billion stars. So there's the billion number again. And they're carried away from each other by expanding space and a Big Bang beginning. So that's the basic architecture of our universe. And I just want to talk a little bit about the discovery of those two things that happened about 100 years ago, not quite 100 years ago. So um, this is the night sky. Um, and most of these stars are in our galaxy. And I think this is from a California mountaintop. And can you see the trees there? So it's a big part of the sky. And um, about 100 years ago, all we knew of was our own galaxy and these fuzzy little patches on the sky. Do you see that little fuzzball? OK, called the nebulae. And uh, nobody knew what the nebulae were. And the person who solved that puzzle, where did he get his PhD? <laughs> University of Chicago. So that was Hubble. <laughs> so Hubble, using the 100-inch telescope at Mount Wilson, the Hooker Telescope um, resolves stars in that fuzzball. Actually, let me just go back. That's the Andromeda. That's one of the few galaxies you can see with the naked eye. And showed that uh, it was an island universe. It was another galaxy. And so that meant that most of the nebulae were other galaxies. And Hubble enlarged the universe. I think this is a record. I'm not even sure Trump's inauguration beats this record. Uh, <laughs> We're not taping this, are we? Uh, 100 billion. He, he enlarged the universe up by a factor of 100 billion. So the other th oh, here's um, so evidence. So this is the deepest image that we have of the universe. This is the Hubble Deep Field. And in this image, you see a lot of smudgy little things. And you see a couple of stars. There's a star. There's a star. This is a tiny bit of the sky. And in this image, there are 10,000 galaxies. And this is 1 10 millionth of the sky. And so if you multiply 10 million times 100,000, you get 100 billion galaxies in the universe. So 100 billion galaxies in the universe. The other thing that Hubble did was uh, he noticed that the galaxies had a pattern of motion um, that we call the Hubble flow. Uh, here's our galaxy, and the other galaxies are moving away from us. Uh, and the galaxies that are further away are moving faster. And if you think about this, this looks, oh, let's see, that, 
looks like uh, in the past all the galaxies must have been top, on top of one another. And in fact, uh, this pattern of motion is the pattern of the Big Bang. But the person who correctly interpreted that for us, uh, with a little bit of help some, with, from, from some other theorists, was Einstein. So the Big Bang was not an explosion of galaxies into space. It was an explosion of space with the galaxies being carried along. So uh, Einstein's general theory of relativity says that space is flexible, time warps. So space being flexible, the expansion of the universe is actually space expanding and galaxies being carried along. And I'll show you how this works. So there's space, there are the galaxies. Can you see it expand? Okay, now uh, this is our galaxy. Let's line up those three uh, time frames together. And so you can see from our point of view, all the other galaxies are moving away from us. So are we the center of the universe? Well, the way we, discover, the way we do things in science is by polling. How many people say we're at the center of the universe? <laughs> okay. Uh, well, let's try another galaxy. If we line them up on this galaxy, that galaxy sees the same thing, everyone moving away from it. Uh, and of course, I should have drawn more galaxies here. And uh, you know, if we were in Cambridge, Massachusetts, at you know, one of those small schools there like Harvard, it would take a third time to convince them. So we'll <laughs> line it up on that case, say the same thing. So uh, no center, just different perspectives. Uh, another way to say this is that everyone's at the center of their universe. <laughs> I know on the left coast you don't know that, but it, you know, at Harvard, everyone's at the center of their universe. Okay, so let, let's go back uh, before this re revolution of joining particle physics and cosmology. The big questions of cosmology in 1978 uh, were articulated by Alan Sandage, who was Hubble's student. And uh, Sandage said cosmology is just two numbers, H naught and Q naught. And I'll tell you a little bit about those numbers. And they are really important numbers. And this is a beautiful drawing of the 200 inch telescope at Mount Palomar that doesn't project that well. And Sandage said uh, all of those, we're going to resolve that with, with uh, this telescope. So he called cosmology a search for two numbers. So let me tell you just a little bit about those numbers. They're important. Uh, so here's the size of the universe uh, against time. So the universe is getting bigger, and so the unit, that means the universe is expanding, but of course it's slowing down due to gravity, and so the question is, how much is it slowing down? Is it slowing down enough so that it eventually stops expanding and falls back on itself, or does it expand forever? And so let me tell you about H naught. That's the expansion rate today. For the mathematically inclined, that's the slope of this line, and that gives you the age of the universe. That's a pretty important number. Uh, Q naught is the deceleration parameter, and I'm gonna use a technical term from mathematics. It's the droopiness of the line. So uh, if the line really droops, it's slowing down a lot, and the universe will recollapse. So these two numbers were age and destiny. Of the, that's pretty important. So that was the conversation. And just to calibrate things at that time, cosmology was tens of astronomers working alone, uh, solitary, uh, trying to figure it all out without the help of physicists. Okay, you may have heard about uh, a discovery, well, you hear a lot about Nobel Prizes here at Berkeley. So not all the Nobel Prizes go to people at Berkeley, even though maybe they should. Uh, Penzias and Wilson got a Nobel Prize in 1978 for uh, detecting the microwave echo of the Big Bang, cosmic microwaves. And the upshot of that is they discovered that it wasn't just a Big Bang, it was a hot Big Bang. And in the beginning, and I'm, this is a technical term, it was hotter than hell. <laughs> and when you heat something up, it's reduced to its most fundamental entities. And uh, around 1980, uh, the particle physicists were realizing that uh, the fundamental entities were the quarks and the lepton leptons. So the six quarks that we now know of, up, charm, top, down, strange, bottom, and then the electron uh, and its friends, including the neutrinos, and the force-carrying particles, the photon, the gluon, and then of course in the middle, the Higgs boson. 
So in the beginning, the universe was quark soup. Okay, so that's the big idea. And so here is the universe starts as quark soup and then it, as it expands, it cools and layer upon layer of structure is built. And at that time in 1980, this is the part that we understood. At about one one hundred thousandth of a second, the universe was neutrons and protons. Uh, the universe was a nuclear reactor and made some helium and deuterium and then atoms formed. And then uh, at about 400,000 years, uh, gravity took over and took any lumps in the matter and brought them together and made the galaxy. So this is the picture we had. But I call your attention uh, to this early, this first microsecond, um, the quark soup era. So is anything interesting happened to, during that time? So I came along to cosmology late, and so I was assigned the first microsecond. That's all that was left. So the question is, did anything interesting happen then? And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to argue that that is the most interesting time. And so the 19, 1980s, uh, I guess if you can remember them, you weren't there. Isn't there some joke like that? Anyway, I can sort of remember them. Uh, and Saul alluded to this. We had a really good time. These were the go-go days of cosmology. Uh, new ideas every day. It was a great time to be a young scientist. And the particle physicists were trying to figure out how to unify the forces and particles of nature. And uh, we had the most powerful accelerator, the Big Bang. And so we were looking at the implications of these ideas. So we had a conference at Fermilab called Inner Space, Outer Space in 1984 that kind of was the announcement of this field. I'll show you how important it was in a second. Uh, I'll tell you a little story about this book. Uh, Rocky Cobb was mentioned earlier, and we, were, we organized this conference. And we had to get the book published. So we went to the University of Chicago Press, and they said, well, you know, we don't do proceedings of conferences. And we said, no, this is not a conference proceedings. This is a milestone in human knowledge. <laughs> and so they said, OK, we'll do that. Um, and not only that, because you know, last week was the Olympics, so probably most people don't remember this. This inner space, outer space, the official conference of the 1984 Summer Olympics. <laughs> and not only that, this was we, Rocky and I pioneered financing of conferences by selling conference t-shirts. <laughs> These are still available on eBay. <laughs> Make sure you get a genuine one. Okay, so lots of ideas. And what I like to say, at least for this talk, is we change the vocabulary of cosmology. So we change the conversation. So we talked about Q naught and H naught, and you'll only hear about them one more time. And so the words now that you hear about are quark soup, dark matter, dark energy, inflation, uh, cold dark matter. I don't know if I'll talk about WIMPs and periogenesis, but the vocabulary of the field was changed. And so, uh, oh, and also it went from a little cottage industry to uh, we brought in those nasty physicists. So physicists and astronomers working together uh, to figure it all out. Okay, so let's talk about dark matter, inflation, and uh, dark energy. So in 1970s, uh, the late Vera Rubin uh, discovered dark matter. So how did she do that? Um, so she was looking at, um, I, I believe this actually is the rotation curve of the Andromeda galaxy. So here's the Andromeda galaxy. And the stars in Andromeda are moving around on Andromeda. And uh, this chart here is how fast they're moving around Andromeda, uh, plotted against how far they, their distance from the center of Andromeda. And I said flat rotation curve, so this is called the rotation curve. You'll notice that the stars that are way out there are still moving fast. Does everyone see that? And if all the gravity were due to the stars, you don't need math to realize that shouldn't happen. Because when you're getting way far out there, the gravity is weakening and you better be moving slower, otherwise you're gonna escape. And so this was the evidence for dark matter. And so uh, the upshot is the galaxy uh, has this starry nugget, but it's surrounded by an enormous, we call it a halo of dark matter. 
So the question was, what is the dark matter? And I, w I won't bore you with going through all the things we eliminated, but the, the best bet is the dark matter is a new form of matter predicted to exist by these particle physics theories that unify the forces of nature. So that's the idea. The particle, the dark matter particle is something new. And uh, here are the, here are actually, these are all still current today. This is a slide from 1990. Uh, the axion, the neutralino, everybody's heard of superstring theory. So the neutralino is the lightest supersymmetric particle. Here were the neutrinos. So those are particles known to exist. So they're not quite as interesting. Um, and we now know they have mass, but they only contribute a few percent. So they're a spice. So the idea is that the dark matter is a new form of matter in the universe. OK. So another puzzle that uh, had been with people uh, was the following. is Here's our universe today. Uh, the galaxies are blue. and they're nicely distributed around the universe, and we live in an old universe. Okay, And you can ask yourself, well, how did the universe have to begin to get to a universe that looks as regular as ours and is as old as ours? And it turns out that uh, it requires very special initial conditions. You'd have to begin the universe in a very special way. And Stephen Hawking and a graduate student asked, well, if you just kind of threw a dart at the dartboard of initial conditions, just started the universe any old way, what would happen? Uh, in a very short amount of time, I'll let you read it, uh, you would end up with a mess. Black holes, and you wouldn't end up with our universe. OK, so, uh, okay, so how does that work? Uh, well, the universe could have started that way. So it's not a logical inconsistency. They didn't show there's no way to start the universe to get ours, but they said it would have to be very special. So there was a challenge out there can you make the current state of our universe less dependent on the initial conditions? And so that's explained by this idea of cosmic inflation that I'm going to talk about now. So the idea is very, very simple. So you take this highly irregular universe, or this more typical universe, and you focus on a tiny little bit of it. And the mathematicians say that even if you take this initial space time that's highly curved and all kinds of uh, bendings and everything, if you take a small enough bit of it, it will look smooth and flat. But of course, it won't be big enough for us. Well, blow it up. So if the universe grows by an enormous amount, uh, which I've shown here, so take this little black thing and it becomes this big black circle. Uh, it's smooth, it's flat, and we can fit in it. So if you have this a tremendous growth spurt early on, you can get around this dilemma of needing special initial conditions. And uh, just as they say, actually no one watches TV, but remember the old commercials, uh, but there's more. And the more is, remember I mentioned that in order to understand galaxies and structure in the universe, you need lumpiness. You need the matter to be distributed not uniformly. You need there to be more matter in some places and less matter in others. And so what inflation does, remember what it does is it blows things up. So where is there natural lumpiness or variations? At the subatomic scale, they're called quantum fluctuations. Things are jitterbugging around. But the subatomic scale is much smaller than a galaxy. So how can that work? Well, inflation stretches these subatomic quantum fluctuations into enormous uh, fluctuations of enormous wavelength. And they uh, end up being places of more matter and less matter. And they become the seeds for the large scale structure in the universe. OK. Uh, so inflation, so how did this happen? So. Uh, uh, when we used to explain this, we said, well, there's this scalar field, and we start with a state of false vacuum, and we didn't know any scalar fields, and now we know one, the Higgs. So the Higgs is a scalar field. So there's a field that might be the Higgs, probably not, but is a cousin of the Higgs that, that drives inflation. And so this early growth spurt is driven by a scalar field related, hopefully, to the Higgs field, tremendous amount of expansion, and when this false vacuum energy decays, it creates the quark soup. 
That's idea number two. Um, and Stephen Hawking, I think everyone recognizes Stephen in this picture. And uh, I'll let you find me in this picture. I'm the one with the good legs. <laughs> so that's just a little hint. So Stephen Hawking uh, had the world's most amazing uh, workshop in the June of 1983, where most of these details were worked out. And I know we, I guess, well, Jim Bardeen is smiling, and Stephen is smiling, and some of us look more, well, Paul Steinhardt is smiling. But it was a fantastic uh, workshop where work actually got done, and the details of this got worked out. So now let me bring you to dark energy. Uh, which uh, Saul mentioned. And so, uh, you know, Sandage carefully defined the deceleration parameter because we know the universe is decelerating, not accelerating. So you have to put a minus sign in there. And of course, once Saul and his colleagues measured it, it turns out that the universe is actually speeding up. Okay, so how can that happen? Well, repulsive gravity is a feature of Einstein's theory. I don't mean that Einstein's theory is repulsive to study, but uh, in it, uh, you can have uh, forms of energy that have repulsive gravity. And uh, they're called dark energy, as, as Saul explains. So that's the definition of dark energy. So what would be an example of dark energy? So the simplest example of dark energy is the energy of quantum nothingness. So I know this is California, so this is the Zen part of the talk. So we all want to, uh, so uh, what is nothing? Nothing is something. Uh, it's filled with particles living on borrowed time and borrowed energy. And so the quantum vacuum is alive with these virtual particles. And I can prove it to you, but I bet you're willing to trust me, although you should never trust us, you know, nullius in verba, take no one's word for it. Um, the gravity of, uh, of quantum nothingness is repulsive. And so this is a great theoretical triumph that the energy, the quantum energy of the vacuum explains cosmic um, acceleration give or take a factor of 10 to the 55. <laughs> OK, we're going to, we'll whittle that down. Uh, so that's one of the puzzles. We'll come back to that. So let's see. So cosmic acceleration is caused by the repulsive gravity of quantum nothingness. So the, the quantum, this quantum nothingness has another name, and it's Einstein's cosmological constant. So he invented this by accident, which is why his picture was on the cover of that science magazine. Uh, any questions? <laughs> well, one was phoned in by Sir Arthur Eddington. Uh, you may remember he was one of the early adopters of uh, general relativity. And there's a wonderful story about Eddington. Um, he, so he's a real expert on it. And he was interviewed, I think, by the New York Times. And they said it's said that, uh, what did they say, that only three people understand general relativity. And he said, who's the other one? <laughs> anyway. He says, no experimental results should be accepted until confirmed by theory. And so that, what he's really saying is science is not just a book of facts, but it's understanding. And so we have to understand, we've got to resolve, you know, within 10 to the 55 is not good enough. OK, so we've got a bit of a puzzle there. OK, so we put all of these pieces together. And this is our story of the universe right now. We have a pretty name for it. It's called lambda CDM. So lambda is the symbol for Einstein's cosmological constant. And then CDM is the dark matter is slowly moving, so we call it cold. OK, so here's our story. A jiffy after the beginning. There's the definition of a jiffy. Uh, we have a tremendous burst of expansion. That was the inflation that smooth space-time created the hot quark soup and turned subatomic fluctuations into the seeds for galaxies. Um, and then up until uh, one one hundred thousandth of a second, we had the quark soup era, which, during which ordinary matter and dark matter were created. Uh, from one one hundred thousandth of a second to three hundred seconds, the neutrons, protons, and then the nuclei, the lightest elements, were created. 
And then from about 100,000 years to 5 billion years, the gravity of dark matter builds cosmic structure from uh, the quantum seeds that I talked about. And then at 5 billion years, the universe starts speeding up. And dark energy takes over, speeds up the expansion, the structure formation is over. So that's our, that's our story today. Um, very different, uh, let's see, so I showed you this picture earlier. Uh, so indeed, interesting things were happening back here uh, during the quark soup phase. That's where the dark matter and ordinary matter evolved and this inflation happened. So it kind of set, uh, it established some of the most important features of the universe today. So we've got these uh, seeds uh, that were created by inflation and then gravity uh, this is an easy theory, the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. So where there's more matter, uh, gravity pulls more matter in and you get galaxies and where there's less matter, uh, nothing happens. So structure gets built up by gravity. And the way the gravity gets built up is small things form, like galaxies form first and then larger things form later. And this theory is highly predictive, better than this cartoon which shows time going down. Uh, much more predictive theory than this cartoon would suggest. Okay, uh, so I know it's a bit quaint, uh, but evidence still counts in science. So uh, you can't just have a good story, you have to have evidence that backs it up. And so there's a wealth of evidence that backs this up. And so I'm just gonna quickly go through uh, some of it. So this is, this is a graph that I ask you to bear with me on. This, this is a wonderful graph that recommend, that, uh, testifies to how powerful our instruments are. So um, this is uh, the rate at which stars and galaxies form. Actually, it's the logarithm of the rate, but don't worry about that. And uh, since this is from a Hebrew manuscript, it reads from the right to the left. Uh, so here's time zero, one billion years, two billion years, three billion years, 10 billion, and then this last little tick is today. And so it shows the formation of st structure, uh, sorry, the formation of stars uh, peaking at about the time that this theory called dark matter says and then falling off. And to me, this explains a lot, right? Because the, this is a logarithmic scale, so star formation has fallen off by more than a factor of 30. So a lot of the evidence comes from the cosmic microwave background. So I wanna talk a little bit about that. So um, here we are, we look out in space, we look back in time. So uh, here are some of the very distant galaxies that are seen in the Hubble Deep Field. Then there's a time we can't see back to because stars hadn't lit up yet. We call that the dark ages. And then here is where those microwaves that Penzias and Wilson had discovered. So they're coming to us from when the universe was about 400,000 years old, before there were stars, before there were galaxies, and it reveals the distribution in, of the matter. It gives us a uh, snapshot of, of the baby universe. So now let me show you what that looks like. And again, I have to come back to Berkeley here. So uh, the COBE satellite, uh, a team led by George Smoot, discovered the variations in the intensity of the microwave background that was announced in 1992. And uh, so the blue spots are where the density is lower and the red spots, well, none of them here are red, are where it's higher. I'll come back to that in a second. And so you're seeing the distribution of matter in the infant universe. And uh, then the WMAP satellite uh, that was flown by NASA uh, and then most recently the Planck satellite has given us our best view of this, uh, of the infant universe. And I wanna just point something out here that is absolutely remarkable to me. So you all know about product placement, right? It's really important. S.H., Stephen Hawking. <laughs> you wanna get his agent. Product placement on the microwave background. How did he do that? Okay, so this is the best picture we have of the infant universe. And this is a test for whether or not you're a cosmologist. If you're a cosmologist, you look at this and your heart goes pitter-patter. You just get really excited. If you're not a cosmologist, you look at it and says, that looks like white noise. That just, 
which is really what it is. So let me tell you a little bit about it. So it's a color scale. Um, and where it's red, the intensity of the microwave background is a little bit bigger. How much bigger? 0.001%. Where it's blue, the microwave background is a little less intense by 0.001%. So this is the distribution of matter uh, in, in the, when the universe, before stars, before galaxies, when it was 400,000 years old. And so we just stare at this and ask ourselves, is this what inflation plus cold dark matter, is this what lambda CDM predicts? So we're really good at staring. Well, that's not quite what we do. So what we do is we uh, measure the difference in temperature between two points on the sky, uh, separated by an angle of a tenth of a degree, two tenths, one degree, 18 degrees, 90 degrees. And this is the temperature difference. And these are the measurements. And the curve is not some curve that I carefully paid an undergraduate to draw through all the points. That's the prediction of the theory. And so our universe, this is really amazing. Our universe is described, this, this curve has six parameters. Six numbers describe our universe. The last time I checked, it took 10 numbers to do phone numbers in the United States. And then you got to add the international codes. OK, that's pretty good. So that's, that's the evidence. And I think I had to look very hard. Wick and I ended up with the same picture of, of Oppie uh, at the blackboard showing he's a theorist. It's very hard to find a picture of him smiling. But when he saw this data, there he was smiling. <laughs> so this is the kind of thing that makes a theorist smile. OK, and so if, if this story I'm telling you is correct and I've given you some of the evidence, that means when you look at the microwave background, you're looking at quantum fluctuations that were imprinted on the universe when it was a jiffy old. And these quantum fluctuations grew, these are on tiny, tiny scales, smaller than a proton, and they grew into the largest objects that you can imagine. So is that a connection between inner space and outer space? OK, so that's, this, this slide is my elevator speech about inner space, outer space. OK, for Alan Sandage, yes, indeed, we measured H0. He would be a little bit disappointed that it was Wendy Friedman who did it, but that's OK. And the deceleration parameter, you carefully defined it to be positive, but it's negative. So the universe is accelerating. And so I think if he were still with us, he would just be spinning around. OK. Um, oh, back to this picture uh, of the destiny of the universe. So how does that work? Because I know you all heard this on your mother's knee about you know, the three kinds of big bangs and the universe is slowing down. And uh, mothers never lie. But as you were falling asleep, your mother said, well, if there's dark energy, the story's a little bit different. And so here we have an accelerating universe. And so we don't know what its destiny is. It could continue to accelerate. And then we have a cosmic red out about 100 billion years from now. It could re-collapse. The dark energy could go away. Until we understand what the dark energy is, we can't say anything about the destiny of the universe. So we have this beautiful theory built upon these three mysterious pillars, dark matter, dark energy, and inflation. Um, and so here are the big que questions today. And I'm going to get to the one that I know you all want to know. Um, so what is the dark matter particle, or is that even the right question? Because often we ask the wrong question. Uh, what is the nature of the dark energy and our cosmic destiny? When did inflation took place, and what is, you know, tell me more about that scalar field. And uh, the ordinary matter, how did that ordinary matter originate? And then what happened before the Big Bang? Uh, and actually, there's even a bigger question. Um, which is more important to the young people in the audience, what will change the conversation next? These are our questions. These are not the ultimate questions. There's going to be some more questions down the line. So dark energy, I, that I, um, my colleagues accuse me of wandering around talking about this being the most important problem, profound problem of all time. And you know, I went back and looked at that tape of Katie Couric interviewing, uh, yeah, now who was that? Sarah Palin. And uh, great minds think alike. You betcha, Katie. I believe in dark energy. We can see it from Alaska. Now, what I wish she could see from Alaska is W first. 
And uh, so this is the satellite that NASA was on schedule uh, to launch, oh, in the early 2020s that uh, we heard a few weeks ago might have been canceled, but I don't think it's going to be. After this lecture, it can't be canceled. <laughs> OK. Uh, dark matter. So we got the full court press on this. So if it's a new particle, can't we produce it at the LHC? They're trying. Uh, our halo is full of these particles. Can't we detect them? Uh, one of your own faculty members, Bernard Satellet, has spent the last 20 years of his life trying to detect these particles. And they're very shy. And you have to go deep underground. So they, they are currently in, in an iron mine in, in Sudan. So they're trying to detect these dark matter particles. My colleagues, this again is the advertisement for Chicago. If you want to be a graduate student, do you want to go to Minnesota? Or do you want to go to Italy? <laughs> and so my colleagues are using xenon uh, in the Grand Sasso Tunnel uh, to try to get the dark matter particles. And, okay, before the Big Bang. Okay, I know that's what you is. Everybody still with me here? Okay, I'm going to give you three ideas. They're all wrong. But that's not the point. The question is now, within the, is now in play. It's within the realm of science. And I, I've selected these answers to show you how clever nature is. Uh, the answer to this question is not going to be, you know, someone sneezed. Uh, so here we go. So let's go ask Einstein. So here's everything I told you about the Big Bang. Uh, the quark soup, uh, the neutrons and protons, structure formation, and here's the Big Bang. So what does Einstein say? So Einstein says that the Big Bang was the singular creation of space, time, matter, and energy. So there is no before the Big Bang. Now, why sh that's pretty good. That's neat and tidy. But his theory is highly suspect at this point in time because his theory has something called a mathematical singularity, and his theory doesn't incorporate quantum mechanics. So we don't think he got the last word on gravity. But the wonderful thing about science uh, is sometimes you can get the right answer for the wrong reason. So maybe the string theorists are going to save him. So maybe this is such a nice idea. Uh, the Big Bang is the emergence of space and time. Now don't look at me like that. I have no idea what that means. Uh, <laughs> The emergence of space and time, what, what it, would it mean? Well, St. Augustine understood this. When he was asked, what did God do before he created heaven and earth, you know the answer he gave? Created hell for those who would ans ask that question. <laughs> but he, it's such a neat and tidy answer. He said, um, well, you wouldn't want the creator sitting around forever waiting to think about. So he created time at the same time. Let's see. I didn't want to say it that way, but you know what I meant. OK. Uh, so maybe you got the right answer for the wrong reason. So here's another one. So that's one way. It could just be neat and tidy that the Big Bang, there is no before the Big Bang. It was the creation of matter, energy, space, and time. So I told you about inflation. Here's this little Big Bang wedge. So you might have asked in that picture, so you blew up a tiny little bit of the universe. What happened to the rest of the universe? And that's called the multiverse, that uh, there wasn't one beginning. There were an infinite number of beginnings. So in this picture, this is a Monet, quite valuable. Uh, this is the cosmic river of time. And so there is no beginning. There are an infinite number of beginnings. So there was no beginning. Um, OK. And so you've, you all know about the multiverse. And because if you marry this to string theory, uh, each one of these things could be very different. So they could have, you know, here's ours. Here's one that has a different number of dimensions. That one was a dud. Um, and so the universe is infinitely bigger than we thought. Now, would you bet against the universe being smaller than we now know? No. OK. So. Um, the, the dilemma of the multiverse, and I know when I speak on the left coast, I have to be very careful because uh, 
the, the multiverse, I, I have heard that it, it's been proven on the West Coast. Um, so the multiverse dilemma is how can we test this? Because these different pieces of the multiverse are supposed to be incommunicado. So this could be the most important idea since Copernicus, but it's not testable, so is it science? And so I would suggest if you think about the multiverse, you either take aspirin or drink multiverse beer. <laughs> and so the last one, um, which is completely different, so you all know that in string theory, there's all these extra dimensions that we don't know what to do with. And uh, so in string theory, we're supposed to live on a three-dimensional brain in an 11-dimensional space. And so maybe these brains collide and pass through one another and we're the bouncing universe that bounces and bounces and is cyclic. So I have no idea if any of these ideas, in fact, I'm pretty sure none of these are correct. But this is now a question that we can start thinking about and, and the first step is asking questions and trying to test our ideas. So let me finish uh, by saying, um, uh, you know, the Oppenheimer lecture is where theorists get to gloat. Is that right, Wick? We get to, good. And uh, theorists say that ideas matter. And this idea of the deep connections between the quarks and the cosmos changed the conversation. So the conversation used to be about two numbers. Now it's about dark matter, dark energy, and the unification of particles. Thank you very much. So, so I think we, uh, we may just have some questions after that for, for Michael. That works. Um, so uh, we, I see a, a few. Uh, so let me start with one in the back right there. Uh, mic microphone coming. I want to ask this question. At the very beginning of the lecture, you said that the galaxies were not expanding in a pre-existing space, that space was expanding, and the galaxies were just floating along in space. Now, I want to ask you this. Suppose Joe Blow comes along and he tells you, B.S. Can you do an experiment to distinguish and show that it's space expanding and not the galaxies blowing apart, or the other way around? What is the experiment to distinguish between those two possibilities, even a Gedanken experiment? Well, so I think the best evidence that we have, the best description that we have of the data is that space is expanding. So the best description we have is the theory that I gave you, and it fits all the data. But let me just give you one thing that might convince you, and that is that the light from these distant galaxies gets stretched as well. So the light from these very distant galaxies gets redder and longer in wavelength. So everything is being stretched with the expansion. And so that's our best description. It fits all the data. And you're free to come up with a better description, but it has to fit all the measurements that we've made. What measurement is not fitted by assuming that the galaxies are expanding in a pre-existing space? Well, let's say you have, to, you have to tell me more, which is what do you do about gravity? So how does gravity come into play? The way it came in in 1930. Let's see, 1930. Uh, well, 1930 was general relativity, so that's the story I just told you. So one of, the, one of the great triumphs, one of the great things that came along that Einstein introduced his theory of general relativity about the time that Hubble discovered the universe was expanding is that Newton's theory of gravity cannot describe the universe. His theory of gravity is not good enough to describe uh, a big universe like ours. Uh, 
Uh, yes, uh, when these, uh, the brain colliding brains, uh, so you're recycling old universes that way. And so can uh, black holes survive from one collision through and be in the next universe? So I think the, the details of the cyclic universe uh, are not good enough to give you the answer to that. One of the nice features, I mean, not that the cyclic universe is ready to be tested, but one of the nice things that people like about the cyclic universe is uh, one of the tragedies of our universe is that uh, eventually the universe, if it keeps expanding, gets very boring. Uh, all the stars die out. Uh, all the free energy goes away, and it has a thermodynamic death. And so one of the things that people find attractive about the cyclic universe is you get to start things all over again. But the details are not worked out well enough to make a prediction like, well, can black holes go through that bounce? Hey, thanks for the lecture. And I wanted to ask you how you feel that according to Wikipedia, you coined the term dark energy, like the ultimate sci-fi term, and which probably influenced physics a lot. Um, well, Saul told part of the story. And uh, let me tell you the rest of the story. Um, so astronomers could not believe uh, the magic that the dark energy provided just, we didn't talk about the universe being flat, but one of the predictions of inflation is that the universe should be flat and uncurved. And uh, about the time Saul came along with his discovery of the accelerating universe, we were running short by a factor of three for the energy to, to make a flat universe. And Saul's uh, accelerating universe solved that. So that was terrific. And so the astronomers said, we're done, it's lambda. And so had we allowed them to call it lambda, then all we would do is measure how much lambda there is. Instead of asking the bigger question, is it really just lambda, or is it something much more interesting? And so part of the, part of the reason to use dark energy was to avoid people using the cosmological constant, to say no. The, the, we, we don't know that it's the cosmological constant. It could be something much more interesting. And let's measure the properties more carefully. Uh, right over here, we have the father of W first. Uh, he named it Snap. Yeah. <laughs> he doesn't even remember. He's invented so many good things. Uh, and Snap was supposed to be the mission. It's now become W first to figure out, is this really just lambda, is it just quantum vacuum energy, or is it something much more interesting? And uh, as that slide showed, I go wandering around the hallways thinking that dark energy is really profound, that it's a big mystery, and it's not just as simple as lambda. Maybe it is, but if it's as simple as lambda, but we have to be able to calculate what the value is. And so the purpose of giving it that name was to say, look, this isn't just lambda. This is a much bigger puzzle. Thanks for asking the question. Do we have some other uh, student, students who are, who are waiting? Yeah. Oh, here's one. Yeah. So, so, hello. So, as a physics student, I actually wanted to ask you um, more of a philosophical question, and that is, are you hiring? <laughs> <laughs> We, we would, uh, that, that was a good pitch. We'd love to have you at Chicago. You're an undergraduate? Okay, you know my email. You want to be a cosmologist? Did your heart go pitter patter? Okay. You had too much of Berkeley, you're ready for Chicago? Okay, good. And, some, and, and any other students who actually want to stay here? That's right. That's right. <laughs> So I think it's going to right there. Hi. Hello. Um, does quantum entanglement play any part of the theories of the, the Big Bang? Say, say it again. Does quantum entanglement play any part in the theories of the Big Bang? Not yet. All right. But it could. So uh, the, um, 
let's see, boy, I, I thought emergence was hard to say. I'm just gonna say the words, I don't understand them. But some of the people studying quantum entanglement say that quantum entanglement is what space-time is, that space-time is made of quantum entanglement. <laughs> That's all I'm gonna say. I'm not gonna say any more about that. But I, well, I do, will say a little bit more about this, that uh, as I was telling the students at lunch that um, when you're solving really big problems, like what is space-time, you need a crazy idea. It's not gonna be, oh yeah, space-time is just a bunch of ladders and matches and you know, stuff tied together, it's just a lattice. It's, it's, gonna be, it's gonna be something that at first glance seems crazy. Now, because I know you can all find my email, listen carefully. Not every crazy idea is the solution to a profound problem. <laughs> Most crazy ideas are crazy. And so sorting out, you know, finding that one little diamond uh, in the rough. But the, when you're looking at very, very big, I mean, I'll just give you an example of uh, general relativity. Newton's theory had one teeny tiny flaw. 43 arc seconds in the precession of the perihelion of Mercury. His theory was there for 250 years. This is one little flaw, it could be a measurement error. Who cares about Mercury? It's not that interesting. We don't live on Mercury. And look at general relativity. It couldn't be more different than Newton's theory. So Newton's theory talks about the inverse square law of force. So the new theory wasn't, oh, it's not inverse square law, it's one over r to the 2.1. No, it's that space-time is flexible. And so these new ideas to explain the big puzzles are, look crazy at first blush. And so when, you, you know, when, when my colleagues who are studying the fundamentals of quantum mechanics say that space-time might be a construct of quantum entanglement, um, who knows? I don't know, you didn't mention this particular question. I don't know if you consider it interesting, but in this context, the question arises, why is there something rather than nothing? And is there any progress on answering that question, or in other words, the preponderance of matter over antimatter, or however you would couch that question? So the latter question, you know, why, the latter, let me answer the question, I, it's a presidential news conference, so I'll answer, uh, well actually, no more. I'll answer the second question because I can answer it. So I didn't tell you about uh, the origin of ordinary matter. And the big puzzle there is what you alluded to, is in this quark soup, there were equal amounts of matter and antimatter. And so why is there matter today at all? It should have all annihilated. And so one of the things that happened during that quark soup phase is an excess of matter over antimatter uh, developed and not all the matter particles had an antimatter particle to annihilate with, and so you're left with a little bit of matter. Uh, but the why there is something rather than nothing, I think you meant the bigger question, why is there a universe at all? Why are we here? No, I, was, or, I, was to, I was asking, I was wondering whether there was progress in understanding the preponderance of matter over matter. Okay. Good, so I'm glad, uh, let's forget the harder question of why there's something <laughs> rather than nothing. So we have a general framework for that. That was that word baryogenesis. And so it's related to a discovery made by Jim Cronin, who was at the University of Chicago. That's interesting. Uh, he discovered that there was a slight asymmetry in the laws of physics for matter and antimatter. And so we have a hint as to how this works. Um, we now think it also involves neutrinos. And so we're here because of matter-antimatter asymmetry the, in the laws of physics and because of neutrinos. But the rest of the details we haven't worked out. And, uh, but that's how science works, is you get, you get a toehold, you get a germ of an idea. And so that used to be something where we had to say, well, the universe has to start with more matter than antimatter. And now we can say, no, it evolves that. 
but we don't know the details. And so that's why I didn't feature it here. Whereas dark matter, we think we might be actually close to discovering the dark matter particle. First off, thank you so much for the great lecture. Um, you, I think you mentioned that you have some grad students in Italy searching for evidence of dark matter or something along those lines. So what does it mean to search for dark matter? Or really my question is deep down inside, what do you think you're looking for when you're trying to describe dark matter? OK, good. So um, we think dark matter is a new particle of nature. And it's a particle of nature, so what, what's, what makes it different than atoms? So the whole world that we know is the world that interacts with light. So atoms are made out of charged particles, and charged particles, you must be a physics student, right? So, so charged particles can absorb light or give off light. So the dark matter is not charged. And that just makes it really hard to detect. I was gonna say C, but that's, sort of the same idea. So these dark matter particles uh, can bump into a nucleus. So that's what these experiments are looking for. These dark matter particles are very shy, but occasionally they will bump into a nucleus and leave a little bit of energy. And so now the goal is to detect that little bit of energy and to be able to say that little bit of energy didn't come from some radioactive decay in the detector or a cosmic ray. And so that's why the experiments are deep underground. And so these dark matter particles, you've heard of the neutrino. So neutrinos are very shy, and they're not charged, and, but we can detect them. And so the hope is that we can detect these particles, that they're just regular old particles, but they're not charged. And uh, it would be great to solve that puzzle, because this story is so good, but it's not about the best story. So uh, I, I hate to say this in a talk where we're, we're glorifying theorists, but beautiful theories are killed by ugly experimental facts. <laughs> <laughs> and so at the end of the day, even though the theorists are smarter, more brilliant, better looking, uh, did you hear the late laughter there? So that's the experimentalists. They're a little slower. Uh, they get the final word. They get the final word, because it's not about how beautiful the theory is, it's about does it agree with the facts. And so you've, you've actually, uh, uh, although ideas, here I, I, I can't let go of this, ideas drive the field. But at the end of the day, the experimenters get the final word. I won't take the final word yet, um, but I want to uh, go for one, at least one or two more students, if I could. Oh, we have a student, okay. Hi. Uh, hi, I, I know you didn't want to talk too much about the big fancy tools that are being used, but I was wondering if you could expand a little bit on what could be measured that isn't being measured, and what, what could be measured that isn't being measured could mean for answering any of this. Oh, so what's my wish list on things to be measured? Is that? Sure. Um, well, so number one on the wish list is that beautiful satellite flying over Alaska. Actually, I don't think that's the orbit you wanted, is it? Would it go over Alaska? I don't know. No, it goes out to L2. So, or, um, so W first is a mission that we'd really like. We'd really like to better understand uh, what's going on with the acceleration of the universe. Uh, so we want W first. So that's two billion, or is it three? Well, if you have to ask, you can't afford it. Uh, so uh, dark matter. So I feel like we're really close on the dark matter, and uh, so I'd like the more dark matter experiments. So uh, the uh, range of uh, of the of the dark matter space that we can explore, we've got one more good go if we build detectors that aren't one ton, but are more like 10 tons. So we want to do that. That's next on my wish list. And you got your checkbook out? <laughs> yeah, I think those are only 200 million. So you could do a couple of those. Uh, let's see, what else, what else would we like? Uh, I want a surprise. That's what I would really like. I think that's what we're really missing. 
is a surprise. So uh, we're going along, everything fits too well. We want a big surprise. We want something that's completely unexpected. So can you build an instrument that will provide that? I got you. OK, that, that would be priceless. I mean, in science, uh, we like surprises because we, we get to the point where we think we have nature cornered, right? It's dark matter, it's dark energy. But that may not be where it is. We need a surprise to jar us a little bit. Saul jars us a little bit with finding that the universe was, was speeding up and not slowing down. We need another one of those. All right, let me make the last question. Um, and I saw there was, there was still a student uh, that was waiting in the back. Hi, so you said um, that you felt the last three theories that you presented on your slides were wrong. Um, I just wanted to know, like, what do you think the beginning of the universe was, and um, should we even keep looking at these theories if we can't test them, or should we start completely fresh with a brand new experiment and see where we get from there? Were you asking me the, M, the multiverse question? Was that, that it? We call it the M question. Um, so first of all, you should not listen to advice from anyone like me. <laughs> that, that would be a very bad thing to do. And uh, I'm, I'm really just giving you the dilemma on the multiverse. And uh, I, I should have phrased it a little bit more carefully. So our best understanding is that these different pieces of the universe are incommunicado. And if that would be true, boy, that's a tough one. That's a tough one. How would you ever test that? But how do you know they're really incommunicado? So don't take my word for it. So maybe we don't understand the multiverse theory well enough. So maybe there is some way to test it. And, it, and it's really high stakes. Uh, I, I say this, um, some of my friends know that I'm you know, not the biggest fan of the multiverse. But I say, honestly, it could be the most important idea since Copernicus. And, uh, but it's really a dilemma, because it, I don't know if it's testable. And we don't want to, the science brand is, it's not how we want it to be, it's how it is. That's what science is all about. And so I think it's great that uh, people are studying the multiverse on the left coast. I think that's good. And uh, in the third coast, we don't have to study it. And so we have a portfolio. Uh, you know, we don't want everyone doing the same thing. So you have to make your own decision. But you know, it's it's really high stakes. And when I got in, uh, when I came to Chicago, my mentor Dave Schramm uh, said, you know, I think there's something in bringing together the very big and the very small. And uh, my PhD advisor, who was a great guy, said. I wouldn't do that. I, th I think that's too risky. You ought to do something like gravity waves. Uh, <laughs> well, that turned out to be pretty good advice, but I would have had to wait slightly longer for, for uh, something to come home. So you, you know, my advice to young people is it has to sing for you. It has to sing for you. It has to be something that you're willing to be passionate about. I mean, look at Saul here. So he worked so hard to make this measurement. When people were saying, this is a dumb thing to do, it'll never work. And he had a passion about doing that. And it's not, passion doesn't guarantee that it's going to come true. But that's what science is all about, is, is pursuing an idea that you think is important and that you enjoy working on. And so maybe you'll be the one who figures out how you test the multiverse. Thank you very much.